Hey everyone, Dr. Jay Cordy, and in this video and the next video, I'm going to jump into using modern techniques to figure out how drugs work. Now you might think, that's a pretty easy question. It shouldn't it be really easy and obvious to figure out how a drug works? No, it's flipping hard to figure out how a drug works. And in fact, it's like the dread of peer review. If you send out, oh look, my drug is effective in Alzheimer's disease, for example, in animal models of Alzheimer's disease, the disaster peer review is to somebody come back and say, can you establish the mechanism of action? Because it is so hard to figure out the mechanism of action, how a drug actually works. To prove to you how difficult it is, here is the first paper that described paracetamol or acetaminophen in America. So basically Panadol in uh, Australasia and the UK, it's called Panadol, or Tylenol it's called in the US. One of the most common drugs given of all time, paracetamol, um, acetaminophen, it's amazing at lowering pain and lowering your body temperature. Every parent knows this is a teething wonder drug, for example. Your kids go from a crying mess because all these teeth are ripping through their gums to asleep just with a little bit of uh, paracetamol. Um, or acetaminophen, it's also known as. So this is the first description, 1886, that's over 130 years ago. Um, I'm 137, no, I'm 37, <laughs> and I was born in 1986. So 137 years ago, um, this uh, drug came out. And it didn't start really getting widely used until the 50s after FDA approval, but still, that's a long time ago. We started, we discovered this drug and we started using it a lot in the clinic. But this is the paper that probably figured out its mechanism of action. It's not 100% locked in, but this paper did some pretty blooming good experiments to demonstrate how this drug was working. Um, and if we look at the dates, that's 2018. So that took like over 120 years from the generation of the drug to actually figuring out how it works. Now, I don't want to go into too much of the details of the paper, but basically they showed it gets digested by the liver into a cannabinoid-like drug, so a drug similar to THC. And they showed that by, if you're knocking out the receptor, you genetically delete the receptor to uh, cannabinoids or marijuana-like drugs from the brain, then Panadol stops working. Paracetamol, acetaminophen, it stops working in mice that you delete the cannabinoid receptor to, or the marijuana-like drug receptor too. So it strongly indicates the Panadol is binding to that receptor. Now why don't you get high? Well they kind of showed that it gets um, changed into a different chemical right in the spinal cord and that chemical binds to the cannabinoid receptor so it's not across your whole brain bathing it in cannabinoids. It's just happening in your spinal cord. Very, very cool paper. Very convincing. Honestly, this paper probably wasn't published in a high enough journal, uh, I reckon, because it was such a good paper and I was 100% convinced, oh, that's how Panadol works. That's how Paracetamol works or Tylenol works. This paper discovered it. But the point is, it's, very, it's so hard. It took us way over 100 years to figure out how Panadol works. And it's kind of kooky. You guys might not know this, but we regularly prescribe drugs that we have no idea how they work. Um, and so we just, uh, we just, you know, we know that they work because of placebo controlled trials. We don't know how they work. So um, this is a good example. You know, it was prescribed for, you know, 70 years before we figured out because it really wasn't prescribed until 1950s. So it was prescribed for 70 years until we roughly figured out how it works. And most doctors probably still don't know because they haven't read this obscure paper. Um, but this paper probably figured it out. So, drugs are hard to figure out how they work. That's the too long deal, TLDR of that intro. Okay, so how do we figure it out? Well, there's lots of techniques. There's a technique called a pull down, which is when essentially we attach our drug to a bead, and then we sloosh uh, a hom homogenized cell. So all the proteins of a cell, we sloosh it over the bead, and um, our proteins that the drug interacts with should bind to it and now we can look at what proteins bound to the drug that was bound to the bead this is called a pull down and that works for some drugs um, computer modeling um, especially thanks to google fold which is a new ai that has basically told us the structure of all proteins in the human body thank you google um, we're now better at figuring out you know if a, if a, if a drug is a lot like a key and a protein is target is a lot like a lock and now we can figure out we know the structure of the key but we don't know what locks that the key unlocks 
Now we know the structure of the proteins, we can get a better idea for where this key fits into the lock. Which proteins in your body does the drug interact with based on their structure? Computer modeling. Another one is genetic knockout and CRISPR screen. So I kind of just talked about that. If you knock out the cannabinoid receptor and paracetamol stops or acetaminophen stops being pain relieving, then you can hypothesize the paracetamol or acetaminophen works through the cannabinoid receptor. So by doing a genetic deletion, now there's 20,000 genes and there's even more proteins, maybe 2 million proteins thanks to post-translational modification. So that takes a wee while. CRISPR screens allow you to, in cell culture, knock out all the genes simultaneously in a big screen. Um, that's not 100% effective at knocking out, but it's a pretty good start. And that's a new modern technique that we use. It's basically mass genetic deletion um, techniques using cell culture. That's very cool. But this is the one I want to talk about today. RNA sequencing and pathway enrichment, along with, in the next video, I'm going to talk about resistance evolution and, and DNA sequencing. So this nicely fits onto my previous video, which was about uh, next generation sequencing, DNA and RNA sequencing. This way, we're going to talk about how can you use RNA sequencing. In this video, we're talking about how do you use RNA sequencing to figure out how a drug works. So these are the two uh, things that I'm going to go over in the next two videos. So first, two facts that you need to understand with how this is all going to work, right? You basically, you're going to take one group, treat it with a placebo, take another group, treat it with your drug, and then you're going to do RNA sequencing. How does this help? Two facts. Okay, first, RNA sequencing tells us which genes are turned off and which are turned on, and by how much. So it's not just off and on, it's how, what 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 is each gene dialed to in response to our drug, right? Did we get a massive dial-up of one gene or a little bit of dial-up of maybe 10 genes, this kind of thing. So RNA sequencing tells us that. That's fact number one. Fact number two is physiology is typically homeostatic, right? So it's, you give a drug to an organism, it's going to try and maintain normal physiology, even though its physiology has now been interfered with with the drug and how the organism attempts to overcome the drug tells us how the drug might be working okay that's very very cool um, and an important thing with RNA sequencing this was that term called enrichment is what we can do is we can lump genes by their function to get a clearer picture right so rather than just looking at all 23,000 genes simultaneously maybe we see all the mitochondrial genes are upregulated. So now we can lump the mitochondrial genes into a group and say, oh, all the mitochondrial genes are upregulated. Does that tell us potentially how the drug works? Okay, cool. So those are the two main facts. Let's look at some examples. I'm looking at some historic examples here. So M <laughs> excuse me, MDMA or ecstasy is a party drug. Uh, I've never taken it, I swear, um, but it's a party drug. So let's try to figure out how it works, right? So what you might do is uh, have a placebo group or a baseline measurement of all the genes using RNA sequencing. Then you give MDMA and then you look at what happens to the genes during MDMA as well as after MDMA, after they come off the ecstasy or the MDMA. So because physiology is typically uh, homeostatic, we see this result. So on the y-axis here, we have the serotonin receptor. This is a receptor in your brain that has stuff to do with mood. It's incredibly complicated. <laughs> it's also involved in hallucination, for example. So it's a very, very complicated. If anyone sees serotonin is a happy molecule, you could probably stop listening to them from that point on because they don't know a lot about neuroscience. Um, yeah, serotonin levels do not correlate with happiness, for example. So <laughs> if we measure the serotonin in the brain, it doesn't tell us who's going to be depressed and who's not going to be depressed. So it's incredibly complicated, but serotonin does modulate your mood. That's a fair statement. It's got something to do with mood, serotonin signaling. Okay, so at baseline, we had this, this many, this level of expression of our serotonin receptors. And then on MDMA, we have a massive down regulation of the serotonin receptors. So what we might guess is that this receptor is being overstimulated, right? The serotonin receptor is being overstimulated. And so in order for the homeostasis to kick in, your body's going to kick in its homeostasis and try to maintain the same level of serotonin signaling. So what it's done is it's down-regulated the receptors. It goes, whoa, 
Whoa, just for that like six hour period, my serotonin receptors were way too activated. So now I'm going to down regulate them so I have less serotonin receptors so they don't get as active as much. I, I've got to reduce that signal. It was coming in too hot, right? And then what we see is over three days and 30 days, it returns back to normal. And then in fact, it overshoots. Now that's classic homeostatic uh, signaling is you can imagine like, um, you know, say you get too hot in your car, so you turn your air conditioning on, and then your your body temperature goes down and down and down, and then you go, whoa, I've got a, it's now too cold, I need to turn off my air conditioning, and then it'll get back up to a comfortable zone. So that's that overshoot, we always see that in biology, and so we can see that we've now got um, an, an increased serotonin receptors. Um, okay, cool. Okay, so... Uh, next, you could look at other genes. You know, I said, we well, let's lump them together. What about other serotonin genes? So here we have um, a serotonin transporter expression. So if a neuron releases serotonin, we need to get that serotonin back, right? We don't want that signal to last forever. So we have a bunch of pumps that pump the serotonin back into the neuron, right? So we release the serotonin, and then that signaling's done. Let's pump it back in, right? And so then we look at the serotonin transporter expression, and we can see after MDMA, very quickly it gets upregulated, right? So we can see that there's two, again, our body has said, hang on a minute, there's too much serotonin signaling going on, so let's pump up the serotonin transporters that suck the serotonin back in, um, because we need to get back to that normal level of serotonin um, of serotonin in the extracellular space. So we need more pumps pumping it back in. We're going to reduce our receptor number, and we're going to pump all those serotonins back in. So physiologically, physiology is typically homeostatic. So another way is to upregulate the protein, which might be inhibited, because that protein was being inhibited. So now we need to upregulate it to increase its action. So let's imagine MDMA works by inhibiting the serotonin pumps. A good idea would be for your body would be to upregulate it to try and compensate for the effects of the MDMA blocking that pump. The pump's being blocked, so your body goes, we need more of that pump. So um, an up um, physiologically, to maintain homeostasis, your body might upregulate the protein which is being inhibited by the drug. But now what we can do is we can start to group these together into, um, into known pathways, into networks. And using that network analysis, we can start to triangulate how the drug might exactly be working, right? So um, serotonin is part of a monoamine neurotransmitter group, but there are other ones there like noradrenaline and dopamine. Okay, and what we can do is we can color these by changes in both direction or upregulated or downregulated. Okay, and so in blue, we can see that actually genes involved in the noradrenaline signaling or the monoamine neurotransmitter pathways or the serotonin signaling are changed in both directions. The genes that belong to those networks have changed in both directions. But we can see the dopamine signaling hasn't changed, right? So this is RNA sequ sequencing follow MD following MDMA treatment. We can see the dopamine signaling hasn't changed. So what we now know is that MDMA is probably not working through a general pathway that affects all of these monoamine neurotransmitters. It's affecting just a couple of them. Okay, so then what we can do is start breaking these down into groups. So let's look at the receptors, and we can see that both the noradrenaline receptors and the serotonin receptors are downregulated. That's an indication that noradrenaline and serotonin signaling is being amped up by the drug. So it, the, we know that that signaling is being amped up, and we've downregulated our receptors. Now, we can also see that the uptake proteins have been massively upregulated right, for both noradrenaline and serotonin. So the uptake proteins have been massively upregulated, which is a sign that the drug might be inhibiting those uptakes. Now, we don't get any definitive answers from this, right? But what, we can, what we've really done is by using RNA sequencing and looking at all the proteins in the brain following MDMA treatment, perhaps this was a rodent model, for example, we can see what systems have been changed and what proteins have been changed. And perhaps we can look at the magnitude of the proteins and see that the uptake proteins have changed the most, whereas the receptors have changed just a moderate amount. And then we might guess it's these uptake proteins that have been affected by MDMA.
So we've gone from the 23, 22,000 genes in the human genome that this drug might be interfering with down to just a handful, right? Could it be these receptors directly or could it be the uptake proteins? And now we can start to do more specific techniques such as knockouts um, to see how this drug might be working specifically at the receptor level. So this is where some of those other techniques really comes in handy. But you can see through RNA sequencing, we've narrowed our search massively by relying on the homeostatic mechanisms of the org organism in response to the drug. But homeostasis is complicated. So uh, physiology is typically homeostatic, um, and so we might upregulate the protein which has been inhibited by the drug. So in this case, the uh, monoamine uh, neurotransmitter uptake proteins, the proteins that suck these transmitters back into the neurons so they stop signaling, um, they're inhibited by MDMA, and so um, the body responds by upregulating that receptor because we want to get back to the same level of functionality. We need more of those uptake proteins in order to get back to the same level of functionality, homeostasis, right? But another thing the body can do is downregulate the protein which was inhibited and find another way. It can give up. It can go, hold on a minute. I tried to upregulate those proteins. Nothing happened. So now I'm just shutting down that whole system and I'm going to figure out another way of doing it, right? So do, using RNA sequencing to figure out how drugs work is a little bit more complicated than just finding the protein that was upregulated and assuming that your drug inhibits that protein because it's more complicated. Let me jump into it. This is a real example. An example is, um, our body generates ATP, the energy molecule of the cell, and it doesn't be a glycolysis and the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain is the mitochondria and glycolysis is the breakdown of glucose. Now, um, glycolysis is way less efficient than the electron transport chain, but they still both do produce ATP, right? Now, what you might find, and this is what we did find, was a drug that inhibits the electron transport chain proteins. You might expect it to upregulate those electron transport chain proteins to compensate for the fact that you inhibited those proteins. So you're inhibiting the mitochondria, so maybe you need more mitochondria with more proteins in them in order to compensate for the fact that the drug had inhibited my electron transport chain proteins. But another thing the cell could do, well, the cell could say, hold on a minute, if the electron transport chain's not working, I'm giving up on that, and I'm going to upregulate my glycolysis proteins to compensate in order to maintain the levels of ATP. So the homeostasis is swinging on that fulcrum that is ATP. I need to maintain my ATP levels, so I don't really need to maintain my electron transport chains. I just need to figure out how do I get more ATP. So if a drug that inhibits the electron transport chain might actually drive the cell to bump up its glycolysis and to downregulate the electron transport chain. So it is a little bit complicated figuring out the mechanism of action just by using RNA sequencing. And so this is the example here. So this is a heat map. Each column is an individual. So this is uh, actually these were cells grown in a dish. So these are an individual cell experiment done on a different day. So here's one, here's one, here's two, here's three, here's four. So the end of the study is four per group. And each of these is a gene. And over here is the heat map. So red is upregulated and blue is downregulated. Red's hot, blue's cold, it's downregulated. So all these genes are associated with glycolysis. And in the control group, they are downregulated compared to the treatment group, not compared to baseline, but compared to the treatment group, they are upregulated. So in other words, the treatment massively increased glycolysis. And the treatment massively decreased all the genes associated with the electron transport chain. So here's the genes associated with the electron transport chain, and they're all downregulated in the presence of our treatment. And what it turned out was our treatment was actually shutting down the electron transport chain. So the cell uh, downregulated the proteins associated with the electron transport chain and upregulated the proteins associated with glycolysis. So the homeostasis was pivoting on ATP in order to maintain the ATP levels. It was doing whatever it could. Could. So you, um, it is complicated, the homeostatic mechanisms and inferring an RNA sequencing data set, but it certainly can help narrow it down from uh, 22,000 potential drug targets down to maybe a few, a dozen maybe. Um, and from there, you can do some of the other techniques we talked about.
Thanks very much. Up next, we're going to be doing a crazy one, um, which involves evolution and mutation to figure out how drugs work. So make sure you tune in for that one.